like him when Hashem made sea and land. He gave to us three precious things upon which our world stands. The first one is the Torah, Hashem's wisdom from above. The second is Avohidah, to pray to Him with love. And the third one is Chesed, a kind act or deed, going out of your way to help someone in need. Oilam Chesed Yibonel, Hashem built the world for this virtue so fine. Hashem wants His children to always act kind. It's not that hard to truly give and help a fellow Jew. If someone is less fortunate, you'll know just what to do. Pretend that crying voice was yours, the pain your very own. Then stand up and do what's right. Going out of your way to help someone in need. Oy lam chesed Hashem built the world for this virtue so fine. Oy lam chesed Hashem wants his children to always act kind. Inside you know you can It surely will light up their day When you lend a helping hand And what you do will change the world For you as well as them You become a Good evening. My name is Akiva Balter, and it is an honor and privilege to once again be hosting the Tom Chishabbos Ruchama Freidel Memorial Lecture exclusively on the GZL Gamzum Latova Network. The program is 60 minutes in length and includes live to Hillim from Rabbi Moshe Mordechai Loi Shlita and the words of inspiration from Rabbi Fischel Schachter Shlita. 
Time permitting, we will have the opportunity of a Q&A question and answers with Rabbi Schachter. The program is best viewed on a larger screen or a tablet, and we prefer if you leave your camera on. If you choose to do so, please note your surrounding and refrain from eating and drinking while the camera is on. Please utilize the chat function to send messages of encouragement, appreciation, and memory to Boo Boo and Estes Lotnik, as well as to Tomche Shabbos in general. I'd like to thank them, both the Zlotniks and Tomche Shabbos, for this opportunity. Here is the host of the evening, Tzadi Zlotnik. My name is Tzadi Zlotnik. Welcome to Tomche Shabbos. We have over here over 200 boxes that are delivered on a weekly basis. I, Monday and Tuesday, all the food is delivered and over uh, between 15 to 20 packers come and they pack each box according to each family's need. And then on Yantif, we have special deliveries, we have, we have extra chicken, we have meats, wine, and Rosh Hashanah we have honey cake and honey, and matzah and all extra foods for, for, for all the families. Welcome to the Tom Shabbos Lecture. This lecture is sponsored in memory of Hanama Alka Weissman and my sister Rachama. We know that these two individuals are very special, special people. They lived a life of selflessness. And Rachama, we know the stories that were said about her, how she cared for every, all of her friends. She went out of her way to make each friend feel good and put a smile on everyone's face. Hanama Alka Weissman, I never knew her, but the stories that were said about her as well were stories of selflessness and also making each individual feel good and feel happy. This reminds me of a story that took place in Eretz Yisrael. There was a man, his name was Yisrael. He moved to Eretz Yisrael from Vienna and he lived in Israel for a few years. Now, he wasn't a rich person, he wasn't poor, he lived a regular modest lifestyle. And the way he would support his family was he had a, fa he had a family and he would support them. He had a chicken in his, he had a, he had a farm in his backyard, full of chickens. And all of a sudden one day he gets a knock on the door. He answers the door and it's an old friend, friend from Vienna. He recognized him, he, haven't, he hasn't spoken to him in a long time. And the friend says, Yisrael, you remember me? Yes, I remember you. And he says, I'm making a wedding. I'm making a wedding for my daughter. When I lived in Vienna, I had a nice business. It went bankrupt and I have nothing to my name. Please help me out. So Yisrael says, look, all I can say is I have enough money for my family, but beyond that, I don't have anything else. And the friend pushes him and pushes him and he says, I'm sorry, but I, I, I just don't have anything. After a few minutes of them going back and forth, Yisrael says, I'm sorry. He sends him off and Yisrael feels terrible, but what else could he do? So the friend goes and he's knocking on doors. He's trying to make phone calls, but he's unsuccessful. Later that day, Yisrael goes into his backyard, into his farm, and he realizes that a few of the chickens are dead. And he takes some of the chickens, he brings it to the road, and there's an Arab passing by, so he gives it to him as a gift. And day two, again, he realizes goes to his backyard and there's more chickens that are dead. Same thing on day three. So in the afternoon on day three at around three o'clock he realizes that something went wrong and he backtracks three days ago when he sent off his friend empty-handed. He didn't give him any money for his daughter's wedding. Anyways the friend is trying to collect money, he's making phone calls, he's knocking on doors and Nothing, nothing's happening. The friend says that I need to go, I need to dive into the Kaisal Baruch Hu. He goes to the Kaisal and he's davening and he's davening and he says, Hashem, it's me, my wife and you. We're all three, all three of us are responsible for this girl's wedding. Please help me raise the fund. I need $20,000 for my daughter's wedding. A few days pass and he gets a phone call from Yisrael. He says, my friend, I'm sorry I sent you off, I feel bad. Please come to my house, I have something for you. So the friend goes over to Yisrael's house and they're talking and he says, Yisrael says, here's $20,000. Terrible, on day three I realized, I realized I need to help you out. 
And I, I raise the money, and I'm happy to give it. The friend says, you don't know what ha- you don't understand what happened. I was collecting money, and nothing was happening. And I realized on the third day, I need to go to the Kaisal. And at three o'clock, at the same time, that you decided you want to collect money from me, I was diving to Akash Baruch the Kaisal. And in this story, we see the importance of caring for another Jew. Whatever the weather is, whatever the circumstances, if they can't do it, they get backups, or we get backups, and they, and they sacrifice their schedule, they sacrifice their time to do whatever it takes to help a family in need. That's what Tom Shabbos is about. I'd like to introduce our Eloi, the Morda Asra of Agudis Yisrael, and of our family. Our Eloi has been very close with our family for many, many years. Our Eloi is a person who emphasizes the Midah of Chesed and Avas Chesed, always time for every individual, for everybody. And at this time, I would just like to ask our Eloi to say something to him. Starting Kuklamat Shira Malo is Mamake, Kosiha Dainai Adaina, Shimabe Kaili, Yena Zaka Shuva is the Koltak Nunai, Mabaina is the Shma Adaina in Miyama. We're diving into this till the Tillum should help for all those Mishpokas all over the world, especially at Israel. All the families from all the Hayalim that were killed and all the people were killed, the Yusoyman, the Almonois, the families, all those uh, over thousands that are in, in hospitals, the Hashem should help them all get a poor Shulema. And we should all be Zoycha. You know, uh, tonight is a night of Chesed. The Chavetz Chaim, at the First World War, wrote a letter, said, if you see a Midas Adin in the world, the only thing that could be Mahapak Midas Adin is the Midas Achesed. If Kal Yisrael goes with Midas Achesed, we go with Chesed. And that's what Toyko Shabbos is all about. These people who look out every week for the package. People call me up, they're looking, they want the package, they're waiting for it. Especially now before Pesach, Purim, Yom Toivim, where the expenses are so high. And what Tom Cheshama does is unbelievable. Helping people Keep Shabbos, have, helping people enjoy Shabbos, helping people enjoy Yontav, to be part of the enjoyment of Yontav. Can't believe that it's 25 years already since Ruchama passed away. I mean, she was, she was a model of Chesed. I saw her in person, how she used to do it in camp, how she used to do it in shul, go over to everybody. And, and, and it's, there's no Chiddush. You come from a family like the Zlatniks. Like Bubu and Esti, a family that the whole family is saturated with chesed, doing chesed, doing chesed, doing as much. If you need anything done, you just go to the Bubu and it gets done right away. Anything you need, there's no string, there's no everything. And there's such a big schuss for Rahman and Shemaim these 25 years. Every year we have these lectures, every year we have these, uh, you know, uh, coming together and the lectures are Meirah to all of us to give tzedakah. Meirah. Today we have the schus to have somebody very close to me. Very close. Mechutin of ours. He's a very, a a few times. Uh, gone. I think he's most probably one of the greatest Mabitze Torah in every form in our door. It's unbelievable. The same person who could give a deep shear and apayoyimi. At the same time, say a nice story with a few jokes to get kids happy. The same person who could go and teach Mishnayas. I have right now while we're talking, I have two of my grandchildren who are learning the Mishnayas from the official. For an hour, they learn every night Mishnayas. A few months ago, my grandson became by mitzvah. He finished Shishti the Mishnah with official Shechter. I got an official who came there to the mitzvah and he sees. So Besides being a relative, besides being close, it's unbelievable. All of Chazak, if it's Chazak, it's Torah anytime. If it's any shear, giving shirim and Leib Avram, giving shirim and Shibas, giving and, and 
And the same person who could go make a joke and make little kids happy, the same person could give a deep, deep shear in Ian, a deep chizuk shear. One person, because it all comes from what's Torah Lishma, Torah Chesed is Torah Lishma. Someone whose whole Torah is to for help others. Anything you need, you want to use my Torah to make someone happy, I'll make him happy. You want to use my Torah to make someone understand something, you want to use my Torah to learn. That's what official is. Anything you need for Torah, for any Chesed, but but that's a Torah Chesed, Allah Shaina, that's the Torah, Torah Shal Chesed. It's a big schus for us. And I'm sure Racham and Shemaim knows what the official is all about. It's a big schus for us that a garment official is, is the, our guest speaker tonight. And I'm sure everyone is going to go away from this, a different person. You'll see. And it's unbelievable how he has this koyach. And the koyach in his way, and, and, and the advice gave him this schus, this koyach. So it's my schus to introduce to you a garment official, Shakhtar Shlita, will be Mahanas. When you realize you don't know what's going to work or not, you say, Rabbi Nishlam helps, so it works. But when you're sure that it's a done deal, that's when you have an issue. You understand how, how these things work? Okay. So thank you very much. Sorry for the delay. Sorry for the technical uh, glitch. I guess that there is a time that something has to begin, and it won't start a second before, and it won't start a second later. It's just, it's just the way it is. You will have to go through a little bit of nail biting in our lives so we don't take things for granted. Anyway, it's a tremendous chus to be able to address this very, very special audience. And uh, it happened to be snowing in New York. I know snow is not rare in Toronto, but over here it's 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 quite rare. So it didn't snow that much, but I will recall once walking out of Yeshiva, out of the cheder, I'm in a cheder over in my office, and there was a kid standing on a big mountain of snow. And remember, snow, it doesn't come often. It may happen once a season. It may happen once, two or three years. And I saw this kid standing on the snow, standing on the bundle of snow, and he's holding a shovel up high, and he's wearing these high boots. And I could only imagine what's going through his imagination. And he's saying, I am king! And he flips. And I, my, my heart skipped a beat because I was scared he would fall into the street. Baruch Hashem, he fell the opposite direction toward the sidewalk. But he fell in such a way that his head went head first into the snow and it looked like his feet were like dangling out and his head was in and he picked his head up and it was dripping with snow and he goes maybe I'm not the king you know what I mean so I think we need a little bit of both we all need that feeling we're king and right away we have to know but only if Hashem gives us the uh, Siyat to help for it to go on so let me kind of uh, explain so I had the uh I had the uh, schos of being in Toronto this summer. I was in Camp Agudah, Toronto, with uh, the Blausteins, and it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And uh, we had a, it, it was really great. It was really geschmack. And on the, uh, on, on, the, on the way back, I'm trying to catch the, the flight, and I'm in a big rush. And someone came over to me in the airport, which was very interesting. Someone came over to me in the airport and said, would you like uh, a drink? I said, um, I said, no, I'm okay. He said, would you like a cappuccino? I said, I can't take it on the plane. You can give me a cappuccino, but it won't help if I, if I can't take it on the plane. He said, no, 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 take it. I said, I, you can't. You know, you, you can, I guess some people know how to make, turn bombs into cappuccinos. You, I, I can't. So he said, if it's frozen, it's okay. I said, really? If it's frozen, it's okay? Yeah, if it's frozen, it's okay. I said, all right, if it's frozen, it's okay. So I, I passed through security, and of course my little bag gets uh, tagged, and this person comes out, and for whatever reason, he had a beard, but no pay. It's okay, one of our cousins, and he, he looked at me kind of a little bit disdain, and he opened up the thing, and I knew it was going to be the cappuccino that was tagged, and he takes it out and he says, what's this? I said, it's a cappuccino, it's Chalvi Sral, I think it has OU and it has its diet. Like he, was, he wasn't so interested in my humor, he, really, he didn't go for it so much. And he said something to me which was interesting. He said, you people can't read the signs? So first of all, I felt very good that I was appointed as a spokesman for my people. I mean, like I, I don't always get this chos, you know what I mean, I'm not much of a baltfila. And once in the summer, they were tried, they, they were mechabed me to daven for the Ahmed, and I said, I'm really not about Tefillah. It was in the Bala colony. I tried. I thought I did pretty good. 
And then the man told me afterwards, I see you're an Ish MS. You said you're not a Baltfield and you're really not a Baltfield. That that's, that's the closest thing I got to a compliment when it came to my uh, davening for the Amit. I never understood when people like, they daven for the Amit and the Baltfield, the one who leads the prayer, starts a song, starts a nigun, and everyone starts singing. And I always wonder, how in the world do they know which song he's singing? He just goes, ah, and they all start singing. Now, I, I start it, and what happens is everybody, uh, I start the nigun, and everyone starts singing something else. Everyone thinks everyone thinks I'm starting a, a little bit of a different uh, different song. Okay, be it as it may be, so I'm here with this cappuccino, okay? And I'm about, uh, I'm about to... Uh, he says, "You, you. I'm telling you." He says, "He says you people can't read the signs." Sorry, I lost my train of thought for a moment. You people can't read the signs. I said, "I let me read the sign," and it says, "Okay, if it's you know a bunch of things you could take, you can't take three ounces, two ounces, four ounces, between two and a half ounces and three ounces, baby formula." I'm reading the sign, and finally it says, "It says if it's frozen, it's okay." So I wanted to say, "And you people can't read the sign," but I figured, listen, I'm not. This is not my, uh, you know. It's not my teacher in school. I'm not trying to be smart over here and get sent to the principal. I just want to get onto the flight. So I said, um, I think it says if it's frozen, it's okay. So he takes the cappuccino and he squeezes it, okay? Takes the cappuccino and he squeezes it and shoot. It shoots out from the top. It shoots out from the bottom. And, it's, and he goes, this isn't frozen. It's mush. I said to him, it's mush because you mushed it. You know, it was frozen till now. He says, you mushed it. Okay, fine. So the cappuccino is lost with, all, with everything else that will be lost when Mashiach comes. I'll get it together with all of the other spoils of the war that were taken from us. Come on, let me just make the flight. But he's not ready to let me go yet. And he says to me, um, anything else you have here? My pajamas? I don't know. So he looks and he takes out my strimal. Now, strimal is the fur hat that I see them wear on Shabbos. And he says, what's this? He knows what that is. Okay, I'm I'm not the first like to coming through here. So I wanted to say, oh, this this for this is a steering wheel to a tank. Look out! But no, he. Um, I said it's a hat. Goes. You have any metal or iron? Oh, this is scary. Metal or iron? What's metal or iron? Like this? Like <laughs> I I said no. So he takes out my Shabbos talus. Okay, the Shabbos prayer shawl and it has like this silver tower, like these silver little uh, boxes on top, and he says. What's this? I thought you said you had no metal. No, I, I saw already. I'm in trouble over here. So I said to him, can I please speak to your supervisor? So he said to me, why do you want to speak to my supervisor? I said, he's my best friend. Just want to say hello to him. And he gets angry and he opens up the, uh, my wheelie and dumps all the contents onto the uh, onto that little table and walks away. Now, I'm a problem. I have a problem now. See, my wife, she could pack this whole office and probably your whole room into one of those little wheelies, and there's still a place for an elephant. Me, I put in two pairs of pajamas. I have to jump on it 10 times so I can close it. I said, how am I going to get everything in over here? And I said, like, how is this going to work? Boy, I am in trouble. And I don't want to miss the flight. And I'm going, hello, hello, anyone? Excuse me? No one's answering me. So I figure, let me, let me make a run for it, okay? They'll stop me, they'll stop me. And I just put everything in. It was, it was a miracle that I got everything back in. And I start walking and I stop and I say to myself, okay, my initial reaction is, this is blatant anti-Semitism. I'm going to write to the newspapers. I'm going to call it. No, no, no. Slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Okay. I've learned and I've been taught over the years, you get into an issue, don't look to blame. Focus on yourself. And I began to think, what can I focus on? And I said to myself that I maybe, just maybe, as I came into the airport and I'm charging to make the plane, maybe I wasn't careful with my eyes. Maybe I wasn't careful what I was looking at. Maybe I had promised to return some calls while I was still in Toronto and I didn't do it yet. Maybe God wants something from me. And I sat down, I sat down and I said, you know what, there's a call I have to make. Someone asked me to call him out in Toronto, and I totally forgot. And I called that person, and I apologized. And the person really felt good that I, I remembered him, and he, he understood. And I got up to go. And as I'm walking, I still don't know if I was really excused or not. 
And suddenly, somebody with a uniform stops in front of me, and I said, there it goes. I'm going to be arrested. I could just see it now. Headlines. Dangerous person. Can you imagine a cappuccino, a strimo, and the cover, and the, and the, and the, like the, a tar of the crown of a talus? What a dangerous mix. I mean, you could blow up whole North America with that. And I'm like, okay, here it goes. You know, another good story. I like telling stories. I don't necessarily like being in stories. But the man was very polite, and he said to me, would you like a ride? In the uh, we like a ride in the car, in my golf cart, golf cart, whatever he called us, like a golf cart. I said sure, and here I am, and I and I get in, and it was it was such a nice trip all the way back, and and we're talking, and we reach the almost the, the gate, and I get out, and I just said to him, I'm just curious, why did you offer me a ride? I, I, no one ever offered me rides before. I was in Toronto. My, my good friend Yassi Skeist offered me a ride. Him and his family, they took us to Niagara Falls. That was amazing. But most people don't, uh, don't offer me rides. So he said to me, well, whenever we see someone who looks like old and confused, we go over and offer him a ride. I said, thanks. That did a lot for my ego. And I got onto the plane, and I'm saying it again and again, that I've had this experience so many times in my life, whether I'm angry at a family member, whether I'm angry at a government official, right or wrong, whether I'm angry at my principal, angry at my teacher, angry at my employer, angry at my employee, there's always like blame once and for all. I'm not going to stand for this. Let's have it out. Or nothing happens unless you want it to happen. There's a message to me where in my life can I turn something around? And as soon as you do that, the very uniform that appeared to be harassing me. And of course, it wasn't the same person, but it was the same uniform. The very uniform that seemed to be harassing me suddenly comes over and he's, and he's the solution. And this is a world where we look to blame. We look so much to blame. You know, I heard a beautiful Vard. Um, whole America is built on rights, a bill of rights. It's my right. It's my right. It's rights. People sue because you violated their rights. We created a country of rights. In the Torah, there's no rights, there are obligations. It is my right that you fund me, that I get public assistance. It's true. The Torah doesn't talk about rights. The Torah talks about it's your obligation to make sure people are funded. It's the same thing. I heard this from Rabbi Sinclair. It's the same thing. The only difference is that the Torah creates givers. And I think particularly in, in liberal and Western society, we're not creating givers, we're creating takers, mandatory takers who demand our taking. And that's really what tzedakah is all about. Tzedakah is, Hashem says, I want you to be a giver, not a taker. The bracha lies within us, not in demanding that you give me what I deserve or Hashem, you put me on this world and every moment of life is a gift and every breath is a gift. I can't live on yesterday's breath. I can't live on tomorrow's breath. And please help me. Tell me. I know there's, I'm here for a purpose. What can I do with that purpose? I'll tell you a cute story. When I was in camp, I was like 15 years old. It was a learning camp. And we had a cook. And we loved the cook. 15-year-old boys usually don't love the cook. But we loved the cook. He was such a special person. It was really great. And we heard that the cook wasn't getting along with the new kitchen manager. This cook was a Holocaust survivor, and the young kitchen manager was determined to show the, the big brass that he's saving money, and he harassed the cook, why are you ordering this, why are you ordering that? And we even heard that the cook wanted to go home in the middle of the summer, and they took him to the rabbi in the camp. The rabbi says, you can't do it, you can't leave in the middle of the summer, there's no one to take, there's no one to take your position, so he wound up staying, and, but he wasn't happy. And one day we came in for breakfast, and what was for breakfast? Spaghetti. Spaghetti for breakfast. So we figured the cook is saying, okay, you want me to cook cheap? I'll cook cheap. And the boys went along with it. We went along with the protest. It's exciting. Be part of the protest. And we came back for lunch. And what was for lunch? Spaghetti. So now some of the boys weren't so happy to be part of the protest. But we were still willing to go along with this to prove the point. Then we came back for supper. And what was for supper? Spaghetti. So now the place was going a little, you know, uh, they were upset, and kids started throwing the spaghetti at each other. One of the counselors came in, wrapped in spaghetti from head to toe, like, and uh, and then the cook came out, and the cook got onto a chair, and you saw he was angry and he was hurt, and he tells us, "I'm here 13 years. I'm here 13 years. I went through Auschwitz. I saw people dying of hunger, and I got to cook for you, and I and, and I know every every boy in this camp. There were 
like 800 boys in the camp. He said, I know who's, who's allergic. I know who's not eating. I speak to your mothers. I care for you. You know, this is, this is my revenge on Hitler. You know, I give my life for this camp. And then this young kitchen manager comes in and starts harassing me. Some of the kitchen staff left. He doesn't want to replace them. One of the ovens broke. He told me to cook twice. The air conditioning went. He said, well, you don't need air conditioning. I want to tell you something. It's true. I went to a rabbi. The rabbi said I should stay for the rest of the summer. But I told him, I really feel it's affecting my heart. He said, well, if it's affecting your heart, then go. And I want to tell you right now, I'm very sorry, but I packed my van, and we were all, no, no. I packed my van, and no, no. And I am announcing color war. Color war is like this thing that you, you, there's a breakout. You think there's a fight or something, and you, you switch it, and it's really the beginning of three days of fun. And we were like, it's such shock. You mean the whole thing was just a, a, a charade? He's announcing color war, and it was it, it was it was such a curveball that everybody was quiet for a few moments. And then we picked him up and we carried him around, and we're jumping for joy. We can't believe it. We can't believe it. And I went to speak to him afterwards. You know, the all the, the everything is the, everything's flying through the air, blowing and the whistles and the and everyone got their teams, the green team and the yellow team. And I said to him, Ramesh Menachem, that was his name. He said, I always knew you were a great cook. I never knew you're an actor. I never knew you're, you should win an Emmy for that. He said, I'm not a good actor. Don't tell me you're not a good actor. You had us all fooled. We really believe when you said you're packing your van and you're going home, that you're going home. Don't tell me you're not a good actor. I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. When I started the sentence, and I want to tell you I packed my van, I was going to finish the sentence and I'm going home and I'm leaving. And I had a flash. And I looked around and I said, okay, you saved me after five years in Auschwitz. I weighed 40 pounds after the war, 40 pounds. I, the, the British, whoever it was, came in, uh, the Americans, I remember what they said, and, and, and they gave us food. I, I didn't have enough strength in my arm, in my hand, to lift the food and put it in my mouth. And that ultimately saved my life because those that ate and their bodies weren't ready for the food after so many years and that eating died. He said, and here I am, and I have a family, and I get to cook for you. So he's harassing me. So he's not giving me the honor that I should. I, I began to think, maybe if I storm out now, I'm just not appreciating life and the miracle that God gave me just because I'm upset about something. When I started the sentence and I said, I packed my van, I was going to finish and I'm leaving and go look, my van is packed. And that's why I told you I'm not an actor. That's why it was real. Just the last minute I decided to turn it around and say, Life is color war. Life is a game. Life is too fragile. It's too transient. The only thing we can do down here in this life is prove to Hashem that we appreciate it. And once we appreciate it, He gives us more and more because that's God's custom, says the Al Shech HaKadosh. Great writer, uh, uh, Talmud of the Arizal. He says, God has a minhag. He has a custom. The more you appreciate something, the more He gives you. So I told you at the beginning, I'm like terribly disorganized. And I remember when I was in the, had a roommate that was like so organized you can't imagine. He was like, and he would tell me, you know, you're not organized. I said, I know. He said, you're always late. I know. We're going to Toronto knows, yeah. He says, I want to tell you something. You, if you want to be close to God, you have to be organized. I said, just the opposite. I said, you get up at 6.15, you put on your right sock at 6.20, your left sock at 6.25, you're out of the room by 6.30. Me, the mashgiach, that's the supervisor that's in charge of uh, waking everyone up, making sure they're there for shachas and morning services. He bangs on the door and he says, Shechter, you have five minutes to get out of bed or you're going to be suspended. And I jump out of bed and then I'm like, God, where are my glasses? Where are my pants? Where am I? I, I need God all the time. He says, you never need him. Don't tell me he was close to God. Okay, that was my joke. He didn't like it. He liked it as much as the guy in the airport did. And I remember years later, we were both teaching. We were already teaching. We are both married. And I'm like, I'm supposed to send home these, this homework with the kids over Shabbos over the weekend. The kids are already on the bus. And I'm saying to the bus driver, wait, I'm trying to stand by the copy machine. He's ahead of me on the copy machine. He's doing copies for next year Passover. And I'm saying, like, please. And then he went off to, to live in Israel and I stayed in America. And over the years, I heard that he was going through some rough times. And here I am, and I come to Tarvadas to give a shear, and I'm driving my old, dependable Astro, and I'm looking around. It starts 
pouring. It's raining cats and dogs. I'm looking around and I find this old umbrella, really old umbrella, you know, just a little tiny little stick left. You know how umbrellas are and you try to push in that little pin and it gets like stuck in between your finger. And I'm opening it. I'm trying to hold on to it to dear life. It's pouring. I have no coat. I have no rubbers. I have, I have nothing. And here I am and I'm, I'm strolling along and I see my old friend and he's coming. And of course, he has a raincoat and a shank coat and a big double decker umbrella and boots and galoshes. And he looks at me and says, Nothing changed, huh? And just then, to add to my luck, this wind came. You know, when, when an umbrella like rebels against you and it turns inside out, it's like this embarrassing thing. And it goes and it like flips. And I say, Watch this. I've learned never fight with an umbrella. What you do is you simply turn around and hold the umbrella in the opposite direction so that the same wind that pushed it out now snaps it back into place click snap back into place i said you see you can't fight the world but you can turn yourself around so that the same wind that pushes you away pushes you back into place and that's why i have this umbrella and he said sure that's why you have this umbrella he said let me tell you a story okay i remind him that it's pouring outside and i have this rebellious unbehaving umbrella and he's all well protected in his rain gear he says just listen to me okay so he tells me what, what, he, what he went through he's going through a really uh He's going through some tough hurdles. He said, I got onto a bus, the number two bus, and Bar Ilana Yerushalayim, and I want to go to the hotel to Davin. And the bus, and I'm on the bus, and I'm so angry. People are schmoozing and talking and laughing. Don't they realize that there are people here with problems? Where, where's your Derek Harris? Where's your feeling? Where's your respect for others? Look at this young yeshiva guy. He puts his hat on the seat next to you. People need to see it. I'm just like snapping at everyone. I was angry at the world. Now, the bus gets down to Barilan. He's supposed to make a right turn on Shmuel and as he works his way toward the old city, toward the Kotel. And this bus makes a left turn. And I'm saying, why is the bus making, why is the number two bus making a left turn? And I'm thinking to, to myself, I said, maybe there's a construction site. Maybe there's a Chetitz like Chashud, like an object that they're concerned about. The bomb squad is there. Maybe the driver doesn't know the way. And we go into Sanhedrin, a real rich American neighborhood. And I say, oh, the people of Sanhedrin, they're very well connected. They rerouted the bus so it conveniently goes through their neighborhood on the way to a great. And I say to this person sitting next to me, say, you live here? He says, yes, I do. Oh, that's just wonderful. Just wonderful. So we all have to go through some heavy because you guys are well connected. Because what are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. You know good and well what I'm talking about. Since when does the number two bus go through this neighborhood? He goes, you're not on the number two bus. You got on the wrong bus. So I said I had multiple reasons, multiple ras rationalizations to explain why the bus turned left as opposed to the bus turning right. But that I was on the wrong bus, that never occurred to me. And I said, you know, in life, if we could only just focus on ourselves, how can I become a better person? Are there ills in the world? Does that mean we should let people step on us? No. That means we shouldn't defend their rights? No, of course we defend our rights. What, what obsesses us? What's my obsession? Is it to demand my rights? Who is it that's not giving me my respect? Or do I flip it around? Because if it's who's not giving me enough respect, then you're fighting with an umbrella. You'll never win. You know what, Hashem? I'm not here that long. We're not here that long in this world. I'm in your hands. Tell me how to position myself. Let me turn around and the world is different. Let me be where I'm supposed to be. And the very... The very source of frustration and challenge becomes the actual fountain and source and the car of bracha, of blessing. You see it so many times. If, if we can only remember this. Nowadays, they say there was this real wealthy person that was making a, a batch of a wedding in some fancy hotel. A bunch of people showed up uninvited. Excuse me, the usher says, and who invited you? Uh, I'm on the bride side. Are you? Oh, I'm on the groom side. Okay. Whoever's on the bride side, go to the right, please. Whoever's on the groom's side, go to the left, okay? And you can all please leave. They say, why? This is a bar mitzvah, okay? There's no bride or groom. You know, if, if, if we try to be where we are and we understand where we are and say, Rabbanish Laylam, I don't want to be where I'm not. I, I, I don't need someone else's money. I don't need someone else's family. I want to find the blessing in my own life. Then we find it. Imagine you're opening a safe. How do we open the safe? Turn to the right, okay? Now turn to the left. Make up your mind, right or left. No, no, I turn to the left. Now turn to the right. Right or left? What are you screaming at me? Now turn once more to the left, once more to the right. I know what you're trying to do, okay? You're trying to make me nuts. It's either right or left, and I walk out. 
that's how you open the safe. There are times in our life, sometimes Hashem wants us to turn to the right, sometimes turn to the left. And we feel like saying, what do you want from me? If I do this, it doesn't work. If I do that, it doesn't work. And Hashem says, I want you to try to be good. I want you to try to be a giver. And sometimes you have to turn this way, and sometimes you have to turn that way. And, and, and there's no problem with that. And it's okay. So uh, I remember I once went collecting with Rabbi Yankel and Galinsky. He was a famous mag and a famous um, rabbi in, in, in Jerusalem. And he went through Siberia, and he was in a Vardik Talmud. The Vardik was like, we're scared of nothing. It's, it's between us and God. And they built yeshivas under the eyes of Stalin. And he was the happiest person in the world. And he had plenty, plenty of uh, personal challenges, I can tell you. Short man, but a huge heart. And I remember we, we were collecting for a colo, and we came to a house, and a real rich man, he's ringing the bell, and I show him, but it says here, when you can come collecting, there are hours, and this is not the hours. He said, take it easy, okay? I, I know what I'm doing. Little boy comes out, and he says, my father is not home. He says, ask your father again if he's home. A kid comes back, no, my father says he's still not home. So Rabbi Ankala sticks his head in, and he goes, the man's name was Barish. He goes, Barish, Barish. He says, if when you're home, you're not home, what's going to be when the day will come when you really won't be home? And suddenly Barish shows up, wants to come through the chimney or something. And the two start screaming. He says, you don't have an appointment. And Rabbi Ankala says, when I come to collect charity, I don't make appointments. He says, tell me, when a fisherman goes to catch fish, does he make an appointment with the fish? If I would have made an appointment, you wouldn't be here. And the two are arguing away, and I'm like, I'm standing on the side. And at one point he tells him, you're collecting for a kolel? He says, they, they, today's kolel, you know, they know nothing. You should know. They don't even know the Ten Commandments. He says, I see two of the Ten Commandments you know. Yeah, which one? Anaychi and le'yilacha. Anaychi means I, I am godly. Yilacha means he shouldn't have a... You shouldn't have idol worship, but he took the two words together. I, me, and you shouldn't have. That you know. Anyway, they finish screaming at each other, and he gives him a check for like two and a half thousand dollars. And I'm like perplexed. And Yankala smiles at me. He says, someone comes to you, you have to be cordial and nice. But let me tell you something. I learned in my years in Siberia, I learned in the years I was so close to death, you can't imagine. And I kept in the, in the prison camps, I taught Tyra. In the prison camps, I set up a secret, like, underground tunnel to bring people food. And I learned one thing, okay? The more you're challenged, the more you get. I ring the bell. Someone says, oh, come in, sit down. Would you like a tea? I'm getting 36 bucks. He challenges me. I said, this is where I want to go. So he told me he once went to uh, collecting a very rich neighborhood, and the man said, we're in the middle of a Sheva here. We're in the middle of, a, you know, it's, it's the, the meals after a wedding. So he says, maybe I can say a few words. For the Chassan Kala, they said, you know, you're a famous rabbi, that would be nice. Wait in the back, we'll call you in. So I waited in the back, but he neglected to tell me that he had a pool in the back, and it was dark, and suddenly, wee, splash. Everyone came running out because the pool had an alarm. So I knew how to swim, but it was funny. You know, I was like a short man, his big hat was floating on one side, and they threw him a tube, and they took him out. We're so sorry, we're so sorry, we didn't forgot to tell you there's a pool. He said, it's okay. My custom is that before I speak by a Sheva Brachas, I immerse myself in a ritual bath in a mikvah. I said, really? When did that start? He said, it started tonight. He says, I really meant it. If Hashem put me there, that's where I belong. Anyway, the guy gave me a $3,000 check for the charity I was collecting for. I asked him, why are you giving me so much money? He said, well, we feel so bad that you fell, uh, you wound up in the pool. He said, you give me $3,000 winding up in the pool? He said, yeah. So Yankla says, I asked him, can I jump in again? They said, no, it's only if you fall in. So he said to me, look, if you create your own problems, that's one thing. But if you do what God wants you, if, if you accept your role in life, this is where God plays me, and that means that the key to blessing is right here, then you will see a key to blessing in a way that no one else can. So what is Tam Cheshavas? Not Tam Cheshavas. Let me tell you a story. The Talmud tells us a story that Mar Ukva and his wife used to put down Pa um, packages for people for Shabbos and would run away so they shouldn't be embarrassed that they should feel they were recipients of tzedakah. And once, Mar Ukva, who's one of the great Talmudic sages, puts down the package and the man comes out and says, who put down this package? And he starts chasing them. And Mar Ukva and his wife knew that, would, that the man would be terribly embarrassed if he sees who it was. So they ran into an oven, to a baker's oven, because it says Better that a person throw himself into a fiery furnace and not embarrass someone else. And miraculously, the Talmud says that we're both saved, except that Maruk, for the bottom of his feet, were a little charred, and his wife came out unscathed, totally clean. So Maruk felt a little bad. He said his wife's merit is stronger than his. So his, she said, they told him, they revealed to him from, from up on high, no. 
But the thing is, your wife gives food to the poor people when they come. So their hana, their pleasure is direct. You give money and they have to go and purchase. So therefore, her connection to the poor person and the merits that are generated are stronger than yours. Now, this is in general a concept that women um, can reach out and connect on the moment, where the man has, to, it takes him a few minutes to leave figures out and open up the Zoom. The morale says that's one of the reasons you need a quorum. You need 10 people to be together in a shul to daven tefillah b'tzibur. However, women, according to these various opinions, but according to many opinions, it's not necessary for women to actually be in the shul. Why? Even though there's there's a tremendous merit, is safety in numbers if our prayers go up together, it's so much more potent. But women have a way of connecting even if they're home because they have a feeling, a feeling for someone else, a feeling for, for, for what they are, for, for who they are. Time Cheshabbos is a way of saying, I'm home and my food is going to someone else for Shabbos. He's not embarrassed because he doesn't know who's sending it. It's an organization and you're connecting to it. Now, why does God want us to daven together, whether it's women that in their hearts, they're, they're, they're feeling the pain of someone else, or men that have to be taken by their fathers and put into a synagogue, 10 people together. So there's the Sefer HaKuzri. The Kuzri is one of the, in the Middle Ages, it's, there, there was a kingdom called the Khazarite kingdom. And they were a kingdom in Russia, and they all turned into Orthodox Jews. They lasted for like 100 years, and then we don't know exactly what happened to them. But Rabbi Yehuda Levi, great Middle Age writer, he put together like an historical novel and in the Sefer HaKuzri, the, he called in a rabbi and he called in different uh, religious people from different sects and a debate with them and try to figure out, we're trying to figure out, to pick the brain of this king, why he decided to become Jewish. But he uses it as a platform to be able to discuss the basic tenets of, uh, of Judaism. And one of the questions that he asks is, why is it so important for people to come together? So he says like this, we, we, we pray, right, Shmon Esrei. Our, our Amidah, our standing Shmon Esrei, consists of 18 blessings. They added another one, a total of 19 blessings. But most of the time, our minds are floating. So I'll give you an example. Someone starts, Baruch HaTah Hashem. Oh, no, my keys. Where are my keys? Oh, no, my wife took the car today. God of Avram, God of Isaac, God of Yaakov. Why did my wife take the car? I told her I need a car. Baruch HaTah Hashem, Mugan Avram. Wait a second. Oh, she, oh, she didn't take the car. No, 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 my, my daughter took the car, and I told her she can take it. But then you're finished Monesra, and you go, you're stepping out Monesra, and you go, what happened? Oh, my mind was in different places. You know, I went flying. But usually the way it works is there's one blessing in Shmonesi that we all connect with. If someone is not well, so when it comes to the blessing of Rifa'inu, please Hashem heal us, so we're totally involved in it. If someone's not well, we come to the blessing of Baruch Aleinu of Parnasa. And we're all involved in it. What God does is, when 10 people are davening together, he says, okay, the second blessing you got right, your mind and heart were in the same place. The third blessing you got right, the sixth blessing you got right, and Hashem puts it all together and forms a perfect Shmon Esrei. And the same is true with everything else we do as a tzibur. When, when a community gets together and says we're going to provide for Shabbos, so Hashem takes that Shabbos. Now, when Shabbos comes in, we're supposed to, when Shabbos comes, we're supposed to forget all our problems God, I'm in your hands. And if a person can do that, God takes care of our problems. But it's easier said than done. So most of us have a good moment on Shabbos. Maybe Friday night by Kiddush. Maybe the woman as she's lighting the candles. Maybe Shabbos day. Maybe as Shabbos leaves. And the rest of Shabbos, you know, we're recovering from the chant or whatever else. We're not in the best of moods. Or, you know, your mother-in-law came and she's sitting by the table and you're smiling and you're, it's getting harder and harder to keep smiling. And whatever the case may be, or your mother-in-law is thinking the same thing, right? And but we usually have a good moment on Shabbos. But when people get together and they provide for someone's Shabbos, Hashem takes your good moment and your good moment and puts it together and forms a perfect Shabbos. And God is waiting for that perfect Shabbos because once you get the perfect Shabbos, the real perfect Shabbos, that's all we need. One, one more Shabbos and we'll all be free. And Hashem picks us up and He carries us out. So let me, let me conclude with this story. So my mother, Allah, she, uh, she was in the death marches in the war and she says they were, they were marched one day and another day and another day and the girls were dropping like flies, no food, no water. And they were in Munich and they passed a woman and they asked her, do you have any food? And she said, you think I'm like filthy Jews that walk around with food in my, on my pocket in the street? And she spit at them. So after the German woman left, the other girls cursed her. And my mother said, what do I get out of cursing her? She looked at me and said, God, I don't know if I can survive this or not. But if I do, if I do survive it, I promise you, I will never ever walk out without food in my pocket in case someone asks me for food. 
My mother survived the war. And when we grew up, she always had a bag of food in case someone's going to ask her for food. She always took a sandwich. So in 70 years, no one ever asked her for food, but she always took food. She went for a picnic. She took food for the picnic and food in case someone's going to ask her for food because that was her promise. Instead of getting angry, I'm going to convert that anger to blessing. So fast forward, she's 84 years old, and I have to take her to Manhattan and uh, to a doctor, and she was going through treatments. It was a difficult time, and I'm parked in Bar Park, and, you know, Bar Park, there's double parking, triple parking, triple parking. People say there's no parking in Bar Park. The whole Bar Park is parked. Wherever you go, you're parked. You don't move. And I run down until I get her downstairs with the walker. We get into the car, and we're running, and the doctor is, it calls, and where are you? Where are you? I, the doctor was on 55th Street. I said, I'm on 51st already. Take it easy. Except that he was in 55th in Manhattan. That was in 51st in Brooklyn. It's, he didn't ask me for the zip code. I didn't lie. Anyway, and uh, I finally make it to the highway. And we're so late. And my mother says, go back. I said, "Ma, why? She says, I forgot to bring food. I was going to say in 60 years, no one ever asked you for food. You think now between the car and the doctor's office, there are going to be lines of people with food. But in those days, we were still respectful to our moms. I said, sure. I said, Ma, can I go into a store and buy something? No. The hospitals have like a bigger phylum room. You can get food there. No. Go back. Those days, what should I tell you? You used to listen to your mother. So we went back. And she made her sandwich. And, and, and it was a difficult trip. We came very, very late. The doctor was very upset. And the reports that he had were not very promising. We were in a down mood. And I came back and I parked on the corner. And my mother said she wanted to walk a little bit. And we're walking a little bit. And there was an old man over there on a milk crate. He was there from day one. I mean, I mean, he was there, I'm telling you, from the times of the flood. I remember as a kid, he was like, we would, would grunt. I never heard a word from him. He would sit there on this milk crate, and he had like a little bag. He was collecting money. He wasn't, you know, with all his faculties. And we were passing him, and suddenly he gets up. I know what he wanted. And he turns to my mother, and he goes, Mrs., I'm so hungry. Maybe you have something to eat. And my mother looked at me, and she like, you know, huh? I had a smile. I forget the doctor. Forget the prognosis. Forget the world. She just defeated the Germans. She conquered life. There's a life after this life. And she gave him that food with such a smile. And she told me once, if you would know what it means to be hungry, it's worth it to go around for 60 years for the one time someone's going to ask you for food, even a deranged person. And that's really what we're all about. That's why we're, we're, we're still a people. That's why we're surviving. And that's why we're going to survive. Last year at this time, no one could have imagined how bad things can get. So it must mean that when Mashiach is going to come, when the redemption will come, it'll come so quickly. No one's going to imagine how quickly it's going to come and how good it's going to come. And for sure, it's going to be in the merit of what you're all doing tonight for time Chishabas. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Shechter. I, I'd like to um, just to highlight for a moment really a host of this um, uh, part of this evening. Bubu Zlotnik is uh, up on top. I don't know if you have the gallery view or not, but he's here and he's Reich for Thank you. 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 Thank okay, you. so I'm going to run to my next class, which I'm late for, but it's okay. Well, thank, thank, you. thank you for tonight and for all the other shroom that we hear from you. We okay, enjoy your thanks a lot. Time. Thank you so much for inviting thank, thank me. You. Thank you. Thank you, you very much. Why did you write at the beginning? We shouldn't have food. You see, we should yeah, have food right. the whole time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> take care. Thank, thank you, you so you. much. Thank you, Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>
These three words they set me free When you got no strength and you're crying please Lost in the forest can't find the trees Here's what you do when the money runs dry Here's a prayer that could pierce the sky Here's what you do when the gold runs dry Here's a prayer that could pierce the sky So here's what you do when the money runs dry There's a prayer that could pierce the sky Here's what you do when the gold runs dry Sing the song, give it a try Speak it, sing it, shout it thrice These three words can pierce the sky Speak it, sing it, shout it thrice